Good morning. How are you guys? Um, as Fred mentioned, uh, I'm Rob Pack. I'm a professor of uh, community and behavioral health. What do we do in community behavioral health? It's prevention, right? So I'm a prevention guy. I'm a health educator. I've uh, been doing this for, uh, since the late 90s as a professor, and I am um, passionate about prescription drug abuse prevention. Uh, and every now and then I get to talk to clinicians and I'm delighted to be able to do so. So uh, I need to know who I'm speaking with, if you don't mind. How many physicians in the room? Uh, nurse practitioners? PAs? Okay. Uh, all prescribers? It, uh, with, it, with a few exceptions, is that right? Okay. Good. Good. So, um, well, let's get the business out of the way here. Um, no financial uh, uh, stake in anything that I'm presenting here. Um, or affiliation with other organizations, et cetera. No, no uh, uh, talking about drugs in a way that would impact their use, I don't think, in a, in a positive way. Okay, and today, I guess, to start off with, let's talk about a definition. Prescription drug abuse and misuse is really using Schedule One to five drugs for non-medical purposes and or without a prescription, okay? Has anybody in the room ever seen this happen? <laughs> How big a problem is this in your practices in a day, on a day-to-day -day basis? Would you say it's common? Is it, a day, is it a daily problem? It actually fluctuates. Okay. Like when another office gets closed someplace, that's yeah. really good. <laughs> right. It's a, it's a pressure thing, isn't it? It's an economic pressure. If you're somebody new into the territory, you really get hit. Right. And, uh, but uh, on a daily basis, you know. Uh, I've been here for 22 years, mm -hmm. so people know that I'm, I'm actually, actually, I'm literally called Dr. No. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dr. No. Uh, not the patients, I can't stand the drugs. <laughs> 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 the right. patients, some of them get a little close. Maybe, maybe that's <laughs> why you have that reputation. <laughs> but, you know, in our, in our office, there's four of us, so they literally will call, like, a uh, night call, uh -huh. and they'll find out who's on call, and if I'm on call, they'll, like, they'll either hang up or... Mm -hmm. You know, they'll tell the answering service, forget it. Or they'll literally call sometimes and say, is Dr. So-and-so on tonight? Wow. Looking for the person that, you know. A little more liberal. A little bit more liberal. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's interesting. So you have a local reputation, uh, probably uh, uh, in the network, uh, as it were, in, in the opposite direction of, of uh, the way some of these things go. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an outline first of what we're going to do today, okay? And then uh, I'm going to go through a series of slides. Uh, and then we're going to break out into small groups. So I have some small group activities because I found that basically if you just listen and listen and, you know, that's polite and it's cool, but uh, actually doing something, working on some sort of small, small group activity and then reporting out to the group, we may be able to learn from each other uh, better in that, in that way. So uh, first things first, I got some slides. Um, and I always, I, I guess I... I um, I start off with sort of what we hear about in the public media. Uh, well, yeah, Anna Nicole Smith, she died from prescription drug overdose. Uh, anybody seen this guy before, or I guess heard this guy before? He had a massive pain pill addiction. Um, so did he, and uh, personal hero there. And, and of course, uh, there's popular media is just full of um, of uh, prescription drug overdose stories and, uh, and fatalities and, and, and some successes like this one. Um, Eminem actually had this album, Relapse. This is a composite, uh, this is an image of his, the cover of his album, <coughs> and the composite is uh, made up of pills. Those, those little, little in individual items are pills. That's his, that's his album cover. The next album after that is called Recovery. And he's doing much better now, apparently. Um, of course, uh, you know, Heath Ledger passed away, the King of Pop as well, um, and others. So we hear about this all the time. In Appalachia, APNET, Appalachia, we actually hear this all the time. Uh, father didn't feed babies for days. Uh, guilty plea in Oxycontin robbery case, right? Massive amount of crime in, in Appalachia related to this. You should not have to lock our doors. And uh, here we go. And so on. So this is just a screenshot. All I did was I typed in OxyContin and got a screenshot of, uh, 
of the, um, the topics. Didn't even click on them, just took a, an image. Um, my friend and uh, colleague, Bruce uh, Berenger, says that uh, you should never give data without a story, and you should never get a story without data, okay? Bruce um, uh, is now in Nashville, and he's actively interested in this topic as well, but let me, let me tell you this personal story. So one of the reasons that, that I'm interested in this is a um, childhood friend, um, you know, was in my wedding, uh, acquired a massive pill addiction and over, over time. And, uh, you know, it's, just, it's the same story, right? It, it, over time, it started out with Xanax, went on to a couple more psychotherapeutics, and then uh, slipped into Vicodin addiction. And at the end of his addiction, he had a 40 to 50 Lorset 10 650 addiction a day. Uh, 40 to 60 somas, uh, plus a number of other things that actively worked to potentiate the effect of different drugs. Okay, so Valium and Ativan and Clonopin, and I've, I've uh, typed out his uh, daily drug regimen, which he edited, and uh, you know we're going to work through a case study uh, a little bit later on on what what is uh, morphine equivalent dosage. All right, with that one and another one that Stephen Lloyd gave me. So. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about his story, and we'll talk about him a little bit further on down the line as well. Okay, so how bad a problem is this? Well, it's hard to get accurate numbers every year. They think about 15 to 16 million uh, use prescription drugs for non-medical purposes, but it's increasing, as we all know. Basically, every curve I'm going to show you is trending in the wrong direction. Almost every curve I'm going to show you is trending in the wrong direction. That's more specific. Okay, so... Um, here is a slide that says, essentially, new users of specific drugs, people older than 12, basically, because 12 is when drug use ticks up, right? Kind of peaks and then and begins to plateau. They rolled up all the psychotherapeutics into one, and it turns out that there are new, more new initiates to pills than there are to marijuana at this point. Unusual, right? I mean, you wouldn't think about it like that. But these are new, illicit users, of, or I guess, uh, off uh, misusers uh, or abusers of prescription drugs. Um, psychotherapeutics there. That's including pain relievers, tranquilizers, stimulants, sedatives, and all rolled up into that column. Now, that's, that's, uh, that's a big deal because these things are highly addictive. Uh, more, much more addictive, pro physiologically addictive, right, than, than, than uh, marijuana. Uh, this is a dated slide, but I, I use it, and you can see several of these map-based slides uh, that point to us having a, a particular problem. Uh, but this is a little bit dated, but look at this. Central Appalachia right here. We're sitting right there. And uh, so we've got a, this is a painkiller use by year, by NISDA subregion. This is, this is older data, but it's, it's still uh, interesting to see. And of course, um, this data actually, which I, I borrowed this slide from Steve. Does anybody know Stephen Lloyd? He does a pu public talk on this quite a bit. And uh, he's in our, our network of uh, folks who work on this problem actively. And uh, Stephen has a progression of these slides that basically go from 2008 or 9 to 2011. And it culminates, of course, in this more than 141 uh, prescriptions uh, per 100 population. That's not dosages, that's prescriptions per 100 population uh, at this point. Now look at this. The, and, and when you see these slides in sequence, what happens is you see them go from uh, brown to pink to red. All right, so we have a, an increasing amount of uh, prescription opioids being distributed, being prescribed in the, in the clinics. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll substantiate that a little bit more, too, um, with this. So uh, these are methadone-related emergency visits involving non-medical use. And, of course, like I said, it's a slide that's showing an increase. This one is Tennessee data, nationwide and Tennessee TEDs. A uh, consumer's primary substance abuse trends, TEDs, uh, rather, 
for consumers it's for abuse trends uh, with a uh, uh, projection out for five more years. So look at this. Basically what they're saying is for Tennessee, other opioids and synthetics, this is, these are basically people seeking treatment. They're, it's predicted that it will uh, go past alcohol in the next year for, for uh, inpatient treatment. And of course, everyone has heard about the overdose deaths that, that, uh, that we've been uh, seeing. Uh, and overdoses and overdose deaths, which of course is another slide that is trending up, <coughs> right? At this point, uh, heroin and cocaine combined do not match the same uh, prevalence or rate, I guess, of uh, opioid analgesic overdose deaths. And last year, we um, saw that uh, drug overdose deaths took over uh, the first, well, actually surpassed motor vehicle accidents uh, for um, uh, in terms of uh, prevalence. Now, what's interesting is this has been decreasing, right? Really nice policies and seat belts and airbags and so on and so forth and um, better roads, et cetera. So that's, that's decreased. That's a great public health triumph, actually. Uh, this is a public health failure at this point. Um, all right. And th this is in Tennessee. It's 250% increase in overdose deaths in Tennessee since the late 90s. So um, you might expect that uh, prescriptions and overdoses and prescription sales rather, uh, pill sales, overdoses uh, might be correlated and they are. All right, this is an important slide. This is one of my big four. So at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna give you my four most important slides. This is one of them, all right? Because what, look at this. Look at this slide, there's a rate of prescription painkiller sales per 10,000 people, sales per uh, kilograms per 10,000 people, deaths per 100 people, I'm sorry, 100,000 people, and treatment emissions per 10,000 people. Yeah, it's a correlation there. A little bit more anecdotally, I, well, it's not anecdotal, it, it, this is more situation specific. Um, this slide is a, is a dated slide, but I put it up there alongside the next one, which is another, it's, it's a more current image, it's last year's image, of uh, drug-related death by locality in southwest Virginia, or I guess what's close to us here. It's just Virginia as a whole, but check this out. So there's, uh, where's the problem? Yeah, southwest Virginia, of course, it's the red. Same story, right? So it's, it's spreading out, and, and here there's also, this is a, uh, these, these are rates, right? So, that, so it's important, it's apples to apples, but look at this. I mean, central D.C. area has also got a, a, a major problem. And if you go back, um, it was a problem, but not quite as pronounced as down here. All right. There was a, a good article in uh, 2008 on um, overdose deaths in West Virginia. Uh, a guy named Aaron Hall uh, published this alongside Lynn Pelosi, who's, who's gained... Uh, international recognition for this work from the C at the CDC. Aaron Hall was a um, uh, EIS officer, Epidemic Intelligence Service officer with the CDC at the time, a DVM MPH, and he basically uh, went through all the death records and uh, looked at 295 decedents, um, most of which were male, uh, figured that diversion, not doctor shopping, diversion was associated with 63% of deaths Doctor shopping was associated with 21% of deaths, and of course, doctor shopping was more common uh, in certain age uh, category. Th this one uh, among women, this is an interesting uh, finding. Uh, and then prescription opioids were taken by 93% of folks, of whom only 44% had a prescription for them. So, of course, there's diversion there, right? So. Just a couple of slides. These are basically his tables. Uh, doctor shopping is interesting because we'll, we'll talk about the market in a little bit and where folks get their drugs, right? We tend to think of this problem as a doctor shopping problem, don't we? And it is, 
It's a pills in the reservoir problem, primarily though, to start with, because they have to have pills in the reservoir, take them, kind of get into the idea of having those, and then uh, that can feed the addiction. By the time somebody is a doctor shopper, they're well on down the path toward overdose and uh, potential death. This is, um, this, this is toward the end of the continuum right here. So, um, and we found, we found that also with our quit line research where folks call up a, a, a quit line, a prescription drug abuse quit line in West Virginia, um, we found that folks who are calling that are obviously well on down the list, uh, well on down the path toward um, uh, having a, a serious problem because they're calling a quit line, uh, but they're doctor shoppers at a rate of about 14%, okay? So, decedents, 21%. 14% for people who are seeking treatment, and, um, and most pills actually, as you're going to soon see, come, um, come from friends and family. All right, so uh, these are contributory drugs involved in the, in the uh, West Virginia study. Um, let's look right here, methadone, 40% of the deaths have methadone. Um, of course, uh, diazepam, alprazolam, 22 and 18%. Um, and then of those prescribed, about 37% had those drugs prescribed. And th this is an average of all of these percentages here. And of course, poly uh, pill abuse or uh, prescription abuse was a, a major contributor as well. 63% had more than one. And back to the, if you, if you, can, over, if you can mentally overlay uh, West Virginia on top of the little notch in the top, in, in the southwest, the top of southwest Virginia, just lay it right on top, right? This sits right in that little groove on top of uh, southwest Virginia. And of course, the hot spots for, for uh, Aaron's study were um, right, right in the south. If you know much about that country, that part of the country, it's not a separate country. Although, uh, you know, I lived there for nine years, and I, I guess uh, you know, sometimes it felt like it, but, and they'd love for it to be. But uh, if, if uh, you know much about that country, what, what is, what's the chief industry in this region right here? Coal mining. It's coal mining. Yeah, this is deep coal. This is, these are the coal camps and the old coal towns. And not, I mean, the whole state's full of, uh, full of uh, coal camps, but this is the real heavy area right here. Some of the first coal mining. Uh, so... Uh, injuries, of course, are playing a role in this, uh, orthopedic injuries, as, as you guys might expect. So in, in, um, this is a nice slide because it kind of shows the, the, uh, the number, it shows the risk kind of moving down. Uh, for every one death, there are 10 treatment emissions, 32 ED visits for misuse or abuse, 130 people who abuse or are dependent, and then 825 non-medical users, right? Now, it, it kind of, this sort of works opposite of the, um, this sort of uh, doom, risk, risk, risk. But this is really, I mean, if, you're gonna, if you've got a thousand people and one of them are going to die from something, you know, one and a half or one and a quarter are going to die from it, that you really got to pay attention to what you're giving them. I mean, this is, this is actually uh, fairly high risk um, and, and, of course, uh, points to the scale of the problem. Yes, ma'am. Was that 14,800? Was that for West Virginia? No, I'm sorry. I, I skipped from West Virginia to the nation. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good point, though. I better, uh, I, I reorganize these slides. I have hundreds of slides, and I reorganize them for different talks, right? Uh, but, but this one I, I actually dropped in without giving additional context, and I appreciate the, the point. Uh, this is a slide that, that um, Lynn Pelosi put together from CDC, and, and he distributes it through the PDMP Center for Excellence from Brand at Brandeis University. Basically, it's a little bit of a mishmash of different studies. They looked at um, all these different states and the overdose deaths, and this is the year of the, of the deaths, right? Looked at the number one opioid, the second opioid, and the third. And basically what you see here is over time, this goes from 2001, a little bit linearly to 2009. And these are different states, of course, so it's a little bit, it's, it's not as if you can, um, you know, make a geographic uh, determination here. But So methadone, right, uh, oxy, and uh, hydrocodone. 
um, or the were the top three in that state earlier on. And then look, we sort of phase shifted from oxy being second to first, then methadone and hydrocodone down here. Are the states the number one state in the country that year? No. Yeah. No. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. But uh, yeah, I, th I thought it was an interesting slide. You know, given that when Aaron Hall did his work in West Virginia uh, from 01 to 06, that was uh, methadone at 40%. And I'd be curious to see what it is now. And, you know, of course, hydrocodone has gone through the roof in terms of its uh, uh, prescription amount. This is a slide I was just mentioning to the, uh, the table here a little bit earlier. These are risk factors for opioid poisoning and abuse among privately insured patients. This is just in Maine in the last quarter of 06. And they did a little... A little uh, risk, basically, risk ratio to see, or it's an odds ratio to see which of these factors uh, contributed to um, abuse among privately insured patients. So, so look at this. So use of three plus pharmacies for opioids. Well, it's, uh, that, that indicated 1.96, uh, almost two times increase for, for abuse. How about rapid Opioid dose escalation, yeah, that's one and a half, 60% uh, increase. This one, though, one plus early refill of an opioid prescription. Something to watch out for, right? An early refill. It's a real trigger. So this is a 6.52 increase in risk uh, to be an abuser over, over a non-abuser. And then 12 plus opioid prescriptions in three months is a two times increase. Now, I would have expected that one to be much higher, but... But nonetheless, look at that. I mean, this is a really strong predictor and a pretty tight confidence interval. So we're talking about a fairly sizable sample, you can tell. Well, it's managed care data, so yeah. All right. Uh, now, the next couple of slides are going to seem like they're not related, but they are. So what about youth? Every day, more than uh, 2,500 kids try prescription drugs for non-medical reasons for the first time. And... Well, this slide's related, of course. And here we go. If you rolled all those up, right, in the same kind of way that we did um, with the other one, you would, you would have a um, pretty sturdy close second with marijuana. And this is a little bit, uh, this is tw very, very new data. Um, and it's a little bit different than that earlier slide because this is just among 12th graders. All right? So new initiates for the first slide was 12 and older, including all adults. This is new initiates among, or this is Ill, past year illicit drugs and pharmaceuticals among 12th graders. Just a prevalence, a snapshot. But still, if you rolled up all of the, uh, uh, the orange, right, Adderall, Vicodin, cough medicine, tranquilizers, Oxycontin, and Ritalin, if you added all those up together, you would have a close second, if not a first place. I haven't done the math on that one. But the point is, a lot of pills out there for kids. Highly addictive. No. It is, yeah. It's being sold. It's true. People who are getting it prescribed. And yep. I'm, I'm surprised it's not included. It's been around for a couple of years. A couple of years. It, what, what's interesting about this, these kind of data, this, this is actually a, an annual snapshot that is done. Basically, it's a survey of kids, uh, and they have a methodology. I'm going to show you some. Uh, I'm going to show you a cool slide in a second. But it goes way back. And, uh, and so what they do is they say, how much of this do you, have you used in the past year? How risky is it? What's your perception of how risky it is? Like, in other words, do you think that, um, that synthetic marijuana is riskier than marijuana? Or, or not risky, it's not relative, but the, is it a risky thing to do? And um, let's see, the risk, the, um, uh, there's one more question, I forgot. But anyway, they do it as, as a snapshot. They're, they're about it. You know, there are a whole bunch of these national surveys like this, and they, they sort of chart uh, uh, drugs over time. And uh, this, is, this is a particularly good one because they started asking uh, very detailed questions a few years back. A few years back. Unfortunately, not a long time ago. But I'm going to show you this very cool slide right here. I like this one. This is marijuana, all right? But here's, here's what this slide does. Perceived risk. Twelfth graders past year marijuana use versus the perceived risk of occasional marijuana use. So what's going on here? It's a direct inverse correlation, right? So, and this, this you tend to see with, with drugs among teens. So new initiates, right? 
drug use among teens, perceived risk being high or low is correlated with, with a low or high um, use. And pre this is pre straight prevalence. So in fact, this one's such a good slide, I want to point out some very, very uh, interesting details. So perceived risk, troughs, lowest perceived risk, about six months later, I guess, or a year later, perceived risk is way down here. About a year later, you see, well, last year, last, in the last year, that year in which we perceived the risk to be lowest, we, as a cohort of students that are being asked this survey this year, peaked in marijuana use, right? So it's, it's such an interesting, almost one year lag, right, uh, demonstrating this, uh, this relationship. Same here, right? Use, right? Well, guess what? The next year, it, uh, um, past year, uh, rather, perceived risk peaks about a year later. People feel like uh, uh, use, you know, it went, it went down. So anyway, so what we're interested in is over, over time, how is this prescription drug data going to chart out like this? And um, th these are data I don't yet have, but we're watching this monitoring the future data set very closely for this. So a um, couple of points about prescription drug use and perceived risk. So two in five teens agree with the statement that prescription medicines, even if they're not prescribed by a doctor, are much safer to use than illegal drugs. About a third of teens believe there's nothing wrong with using prescription medicines without a, without a prescription once in a while. A third of teens believe that pain relievers, even if they're not prescribed by a doctor, are not addictive. We're talking about opiates, right? Opiates, and some, in many cases. And uh, more than half of teens think that using cough medicines to get high is not risky, which of course it is very risky. So this points to perceived risk being very low, right? Which you might imagine because we're seeing this, this um, we're seeing the uh, rates of uh, use that we're seeing. So uh, I always put this slide in because I'm a prevention guy. So past year, non-medical use of pain relievers by detailed age category, it's old data, but I love the slide. I love this slide because look at this. These guys are pre-risk or almost pre-risk. If you're going to focus a prevention program, being a prevention guy, you're going to, if you're going to focus a prevention program, where are you going to do it? Well, in your clinics, you guys can impact this, believe it or not, because your prevention can be directly aimed at parents who have these substances in their home, parents who are prescribed Vicodin, Lortab, et cetera, prescribe these drugs, they can lock them up. They can secure them. They can know exactly how many there are, right? And, and work to actively prevent the thrill-seeking for these guys right here who might be looking for, um, you know, just might be looking for some, something in the house. What used to be huffing, maybe, might be something different now. So uh, I like the slide because that, for that reason, I put my little smiley face there. That's the prevention spot right there. And we've, we've actively uh, worked to get prevention programming done in that age group. Actually, pre the, the age group just before that, 10, 11-year-olds. So um, this next, Question. yeah, sure. Your slide about perceived risk and, and use mm -hmm. is, uh, is a waveform. So what was the community doing that brought in perception, increased the perception that it's bad? And then what did we stop, stop doing that allowed it to you know, fade or not be as effective? I love that question. Uh, uh, so this, this is a, a waveform, exactly. It ba basically, you're, so what was going on culturally during that time, I, man, it's hard to say. Let's go back and look at it real quick, though. So let, let's speculate for just a moment. Uh, this is 77, right? There's been a lot of speculation that actually what was going on in 77 was marijuana was not that potent, was uh, comparatively, right, uh, to now. Uh, wasn't as quite as potent, wasn't um, seen as, as risky, it was part of more emerging as part of the uh, subculture at the time and you know folks are singing about it in songs and, and so on and uh, so that may have just popularized uh, 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 use during the time. Now look at this this is the 80s increasing perceptions right of risk right during that whole time and, uh, and then decreasing uh, you, I, 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 okay, uh, Reagan was present. <laughs> okay, all right, I need, I, need, I need to speak about, 
I need to speak about two things that were just mentioned in the room. Okay, one of them was there, and the other one was just say no. I, as a health educator, uh, find it hard to believe that the question, well, that, that you can drive down um, substance use with just say no. It was too simplistic. It goes against every theoretical construct. So, so the, the um, idea is that knowledge is a necessary but not sufficient condition for behavior change, okay? Uh, so I find that hard to believe. And, and uh, there's been an enormous amount of empirical work demonstrating that DARE doesn't, did not have the same, did not have a, a positive effect, okay, that they had hoped that it would. Now, that's not to say that DARE didn't increase perceptions of risk among those, among those uh, teens at that time. I don't know if that evaluation was ever done. Uh, however, about 10, 11, 12 studies have shown that DARE was a not, an, an, in, it was an ineffective program. And so much so that DARE actually went over, went, underwent a massive uh, reorganization and uh, rewrite. Uh, a couple of years ago, about five or six years ago. Who asked? Nancy Reagan, that being on TV, because I think the media and other here affect a lot, especially in certain sections of our culture. And I know that, that when she opened her mouth and said, no matter what, what end of the political spectrum it was, it was affected in the network of community college and high school people that I knew in that time period. Did you say that was? Yeah, because yeah. it was, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was, it, I don't think there was, but I think that, I think the fact that it was, it was the first lady. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. I, I'm, I have not seen any empirical work on this. As someone that was a youth in the 90s, uh -huh. um, it, it, marijuana was being banned in special education. It was all over the place. Right. There and just say no. And, I mean, it's like, it was always on there. So you get your PSA. <laughs> so you're, we're not so it might be one program alone. Yeah. 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 But the cumulative yeah. effect of getting the same message on the other end of the source. So, so this, is an, this is a very interesting conversation because, um, and, and Fred, I'm, Fred, I'm glad we have so much time today because I'm going to unpack this for a second. I think this is an important point. When we do evaluations of education programs, we do them with proximal indicators and we do them with some distal indicators. So how, how, well, does this, uh, how well does this impact knowledge and behavior change and attitudes and perceptions at post-test, and if we're doing it right, we have a control condition, and then we also have uh, follow-ups over time to see how robust the effect is, okay? Just like a clinical trial, except it's done with behavioral interventions. So one thing that was just mentioned, which is a very interesting concept, was maybe our methods for evaluation of these programs back then weren't sophisticated enough to pick out a ecological effect. How much this stuff works together on a macro scale. And what I don't know is if anybody's examined this at the two or three levels above the local intervention. The local interventions have been proven to be ineffect ineffective. Not, they do not change behavior change. They do not change behavior since in a um, follow-up uh, period of time uh, in a to a degree that is statistically significant. All right? However, this cumulative effect has not been examined, to my knowledge. It's an interesting concept. We could do it now with some more sophisticated analytic tools like hierarchical linear modeling if we could get the data that, that, that are, for example, how much exposure to a larger community was there to a, how much dose was there in a community, uh, if you will. You know, I'd be speaking from the perspective of a person who was growing up in that time frame. I'm speaking from the perspective of a parent mm -hmm. who was raising children during that time frame. Right and had young teens mm -hmm. coming up through that time frame and watched the programming they got in school. So they mm -hmm. got that message from so many different directions that it's possible yeah. one program alone may not have made a change. It is possible. It's true. It's true. to progress? Because I know when I work with little children and, then, and, then, and I work with them in Head Start because I've been working with Head Start for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. And when we get them into school, the stuff that we have them working on in Head Start holds until they get like to third grade. 
And when we talk to the school system, all those support programs drop. Right. They're wrong. The kids are starting to learn how to be independent, how to be this, how to be that. And you, you don't get a revisit, supposedly, until like they're in 10th grade, and you're supposed to be getting them ready to get to the real world. It's like this big gap. Right. And they lost. I mean, I, it's amazing what they lost. Interesting. Yeah, interesting idea. They come into contact with uh, older peers, more diverse social network, all kind of, they have more freedom in the community, all kinds of things potentially contributing to that. I like this slide. It, it's interesting. I've never had it generate this much conversation, and I'm glad it has. It's, it's, um, it's prompted me to look into whether or not there's been any next layer up or, or two layers up of evaluation for this, and uh, I hope to uh, be able to do that soon. Basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple of slides that demonstrate where the drugs are, where they're being prescribed, how much of this, where, where folks get them, and then uh, what's what I predict is going to happen with them later on. Okay, in the the reservoir. So this slide, I've got another one. The, ne the next one is going to indicate, uh, it's going to roll some of these data up. This slide is basically where pain relievers were obtained for the most recent non-medical past year users, 12 to 17. These are 12 to 17 year olds. Well, Okay, so we, we tend to talk about doctor shopping all the time, right? Remember, folks at the end of the continuum, right? 21% decedents, right, were doctor shoppers. Not 80%, as someone might, might suspect, but 20%. So look at this. So for new, for uh, last, uh, most recent uh, year users, 2.6 got them from more than one doctor. 47% obtained from friends for free, all right? 10 percent took from a friend or relative without asking, stole it. 10 percent bought from a friend or relative, 6 percent from some other way. 18 percent from one doctor, and then there's a whole bunch of these, these other things, like wrote a fake prescription. Well, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff out there, like tamper-resistant uh, scripts and things. Like, these are very good practices for your, uh, for your clinics. But for new initiates, that's not that big of a, uh, of a um, I'm sorry, for, for teens at least, it's not that big of a prevalent of a strategy. Um, so look at this. So it's, it's a hard slide to see, but 75% um, basically friend or relative is where they got their drugs. Okay? This is 2009. I rolled up all the, all the stuff into one category, friend or relative. Most recent source used by non-medical users of pain relievers. All right? So we're not talking about you know, it, doctor shoppers would be in this category right here. All right, this is for, the t for all of them, 75%. What that means is there's pills in the cabinet, a lot of them, and they're being diverted, okay? That's a supply side issue. John Dreisner, does anybody know John Dreisner, right? John Dreisner talks about this in terms of economic terms, right? Supply and demand. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a very interesting, so supply. Well, if something's freely available in the cabinet, mm -hmm. right, it's going to be diverted. It's, I mean, that, that's, that's an assumption that you can make. This is just more data. It's a little more granular, but look at this. Source of prescription drugs among those who used in last year, grade 12, right, it's rolled up four years, for amphetamines. 60 Six percent were given for free by a friend or relative. Seventy-eight percent for tranquilizers and seventy percent for opiates. All right, so they're in the cabinets. They're in the cabinets. Now here's a challenge for you: when you're trying to do a prevention program, I'm trying to do a prevention program. What do you do? Do you tell kids whatever you do, don't look in your cabinet? your parents' medicine cabinet, because there may be something in there called Vicodin. And you don't want to take that because you get really high. You don't want to do it. This is the same problem we face with inhalants, right? We know, we know that, that kids, kids 10, 11, 12, are, are, are the peak users for, for materials to huff to get high. So gas, paint, solvents, things like that. That's, a, that's the huffing peak is 10, 11, 12, right? Whatever you do in your life. Do not tell kids, please don't go into your garage and, and, uh, and huff gas because you'll get really high. 
because that somebody is going to try it and die from it, right? So it's a, it's a really, so you can't go at this prevention side with this risk uh, to the kids like that. You can with certain kids. You can with kids at the end of the bell curve of responsibility, right? But you can't with most kids. All right? Yes, sir. You know, is that active or passive? As far as is this like relative saying here, take one of these, or is this relatives having in the cabinet and the kids go get them? You know, it, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I can't answer that from this. Yeah. From this, I just can't answer it. Um, um, I would say. You got to think about the milieu in which um, substances may be abused for the first time and then subsequently. So a kid is extremely unlikely to wake up and smoke weed in, for the first time one morning before they go to school, all right? Or to do it at the bus stop or so. So it's, it's unlikely that a kid is going to do that. So, so they're going to be introduced to that at some point. And then it's going to become much more common for them to be in that culture where they're uh, shared, right? So I would say initially, probably more of a, you know, more of a party type situation or a social situation or perhaps uh, a highly thrill-seeking type kid. Um, but, but see, they're given for free, so that, that indicates to me that this is not part of the, the market yet, right? The, it is part of the market but not part of the four-cost market. But it almost implies that the caregiver is involved in the process as opposed to the other category taking without asking. Uh, and, and when we see both, I mean, we mm-hmm. do see it, we do hear it reported. You know, Grandma said, oh, yeah, I was having a headache, so I gave him a hard tab. Like, yeah, oh, my gosh. But it's a friend or relative. Friend or relative, That's sure. And a sure. relative, relative doesn't have to be a caregiver. Relative can be older sister. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who's not taken care of you, but she's tried this. And, yeah. You know. it, it just yeah. gets at who the intervention has to direct or be interested in. So. Right. Well, I have some suggestions for intervention for you guys in a couple minutes. All right. So, so things you can do that won't necessarily uh, require you to be in the community uh, holding a placard about uh, this on the, out in front of the subway. All right. Subway. I'm talking about not, this, not the subway underground, the subway restaurant. <laughs> We don't have many subways in East Tennessee, do we? Uh, yeah, all right. So, uh, so I talk about uh, just just for a couple minutes. I want to mention um, this: what was happening in Florida as part of this source. So, is anybody familiar with the Pill Pipeline? Has anybody heard of this? Okay. So these guys, um, ooh, there he goes. These guys uh, were just not physicians. They're they're just, uh, brothers. They started some uh, pain clinics. Got, got, you know, they got some kind of capital, I guess, from their mom or dad or whatever. They started a couple of pain clinics. They became really wealthy and uh, just propagated these pain clinics in South Florida. Very interesting. Uh, had a massive raid. They've, they've had to uh, forfeit a lot of their assets. I think they may be in jail at this point. But, but this was the Wild West at one point in South Florida with respect to how these pain clinics were being, um, were being propagated. And what was happening here? Guys like you were, cram- were clamping down on this opioid prescription, uh, uh, or at least trying to, is, to some extent. Folks were like, whoa, we can go to Florida and uh, see somebody for cash walk out with, with pills. They can pr- prescribe on site with, at the Pinkland uh, and, and dispense. And then we can come back up to East Tennessee and sell these, right? And so this became known as the pill pipeline. And um, this actually, uh, we even had a, a local, I think it was in Irwin, had a murder uh, in a hotel uh, that was a result of some guys who'd been down to Florida. Then they were either going or coming back, and, and they got in a dispute, and um, one of them died. So um, uh, this, is, this has implications for us. Uh, so there's, a, there's been an active attempt to clamp down on, on the... the uh, Pain clinics in South Florida, I think they're doing much better. I, I took this screen image a little while back, actually, because uh, this is just a, an image of, the pain, of one of the pain clinics in there. And this is, this is, these are testimonials over here on the side. Um, they're basically saying that I had a very caring doctor who truly believed me, you know, and, and so on. And basically what, what's going on here is, you know, these guys are just, they're in, they're in competition, economic competition to get more patients, right? And this is, uh, this is what was going on. 
uh, very interesting stuff. Which led to, uh, at one point, uh, the top 25 dispensing practitioners of oxycodone in the U.S. are right there. Right? Oxycodone units dispensed. Um, there's 3 million in Broward County, 852 in Palm Beach. So Broward County, <coughs> right there. Fascinating. So, uh, and they didn't have a, a good, they didn't have a good uh, uh, policy in place to clamp down on this. And, and they're ratcheting that up now. So Broward County held 68% of the top practitioners and 69.4% uh, of the total oxycodone units dispensed. No, oh, I, I was no, I was in Alabama in the early nineties. Okay, actually, we had the number one pharmacy and prescribing physician. Really. In uh, Southwest Virginia, nineteen nineties. Number one. Dubious honor, yeah. distinction. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. No, I was. Uh, I grew up here, though. I grew well. I grew up in Anderson County, actually. Does anybody know where Anderson County is? Norris, is it? So. Um, so this is, uh, these are three, three or four slides in a row basically pointing to geographic distribution of where oxycodone and hydrocodone are, are dispensed. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, dispensed, that's right. Oxycodone in milligrams per capita, about three-digit zip code in 2006. Look at that. There we are, dark spot in this perfectly bright part of the world. Love this place. But, uh, but seriously, look at that. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty, pretty bad. How about this one? You've already seen it. I put it back in here, though, just to point out this is still a problem here. This one's interesting. This is a nationwide uh, study of, of uh, counties. And, and in the tech, this is basically variation among counties in mean milligrams of opioids dispensed by retail pharmacies per county resident. Okay? So what this means, is the variation is just the blue to red. But uh, age standardized usage in milligrams morphine equivalent, 300 milligrams morphine equivalent to the maximum. Look at that right here in central Appalachia. Now, what I, what I didn't think I would see in this slide is I didn't think I would see a lot of blue, but I do, right? So some, or I guess some blue, right? It's right in there. But, but uh, in the narrative, and these counties out here look probably disproportionately red because the county sizes are massive, right? You all know that. You see, you've seen county maps of the U.S., and you know these western counties are sometimes as big as states. All right, but look at that. So Florida's just massive. This is still, this is 2008, I guess, data. It's published in 2012. It's a recent article, but I think it's 2008 data. There you go. All right, so a lot of pills being, a lot of pills in the wild, a lot of pills in cabinets, and there's a strong market for pills, about a buck a milligram. Okay, now it depends. There's actually a website called StreetRx that you can go to, log in what you paid anonymously. I logged in and said I, sp I spent, I, I skewed the data a little bit, I'm sure. I said I, said I spent, uh, I forgot what it was, $43 for something in any uh, sense. See when I found this website. Um, 43 bucks for a bag of 20 Oxycontin. No, I wasn't right. Anyway, I, I said I spent a lot of money on it. But uh, the point is, you can find out what people are spending close by if you trust the data. Um, folks, tell me that drug prices on the street are roughly a dollar milligram. And they're becoming increasingly hard to get because of demand. Because once you have a deep-seated opiate addiction, you will do almost anything for it. Right, and so what's what's going on is this one is not quite as controlled. Heroin, I believe, and we're starting to see this. Heroin can and will easily backfill this market for prescription opioids. We're already seeing this happen. I've been using this slide for a couple of years. It is already starting to happen. All right, and in fact, there's a there was a. Um, simulcast last night on this exact topic um, by the, uh, it's one of, one of the um, coalitions uh, in Kentucky, maybe Project Unite, uh, about this exact issue of, the, of heroin and what it's, what's going to happen. Um, heroin is not easily, as easily controlled. Remember, 
we know the supply side of these pills. Or most of them are made in New Jersey or wherever. We know the exact chain. They're, they're logged. We have barcodes on the bottles, right? This is not true for the little uh, uh, black uh, balloons full of, uh, of uh, tarry heroin from Mexico. So we're going to have a massive problem here right away. Uh, and it's going to be from sharing needles. It's going to be from overdose deaths. It's going to, I mean, we're going to have this massive issue um, that we, you know, and here in Central Appalachia, we, just, we never used to have to deal with this stuff. Very, very interesting. Uh, and we can, you guys can impact it. You can impact it. Okay, so one way that you can impact it. Very important. You can talk to your clients, your patients, who are parents, okay? Recall most kids and others start abusing pills with pills from friends and relatives. You got to counsel the parents to monitor how much of this is in their home, how many pills are in their home. No, not think they know, no. How many Vicodin are in the bottle when it goes in the cabinet? Hopefully, if they have any potential threat for a diversion in the home, they will do something more than just put it in the cabinet. They'll lock it up in some way or secure it in some way that is uh, it's not likely or, or perhaps, I mean, possible is a, is a strong word, but likely that they'll be diverted, okay? And then to dispose of unused portions carefully. And we'll talk about a strategy for doing that here in a few moments. Three simple things, folks. When you've got a parent or anybody who might be at risk for diversion in their home, right? when you've got somebody sitting in front of you, just coach them. Three things. Monitor how much is in their home. Monitor it. No. Not think they know. No. Secure and dispose. All right? Three things. Just a couple of, this is not a non sequitur, believe it or not. Law enforcement is, an, is a part of this. Law enforcement is a very important partner with us, okay? This problem has historically been overlooked and or misunderstood. A big deal with respect to law enforcement is how do you know this isn't legitimate? Or if somebody is a massive abuser because they've got an enormous number of uh, pills in their home because they've been doctor shopping, they've got a script for it. Right, they've got one. So, what is a, what is uh, what law enforcement going to do? Right, um, and it's very difficult to prosecute diversion and users. I did my best to find some good DEA slides on prosecution rates. I think they're less than one percent. I can't speak to this empirically. The slides that I saw were very, very dated. But I think we have a less than 1% prosecution on, on this uh, topic. I'm, I, I'm going to continue to look for that type of data. Uh, I do know this. There's a three times lower drug sentence for a diverter than um, for, for pills than there is for cocaine dealers. Yes, sir. But, you know, we put a, a prescription monitoring database in Tennessee. It yes. It took place in January 1st, 2007. Mm-hmm. We're supposed to monitor it starting, yep. and I've been doing it for years, but mm -hmm. starting January 1st, it's mandatory, yep. and we're supposed to report. But when I call and report, it's, well, what do you want us to do about it? Or yes. they say, well, but the other prescriber was in a different county, so call that county. Yeah. Regardless of what it is, yeah. when we try to yeah. do our part, mm -hmm. the people on the law enforcement side totally disregard anything we do. And the forms are long and difficult to fill out. You have a lot of time invested in this. Uh, worse, uh, when you use the PDMP or the CSMD in, in the state, uh, it's not updated uh, to the national level very quickly. And PDMPs don't talk to each other uh, between cities. Or I'm, I'm sorry, between states. There are massive problems with this. But prescription drug monitoring databases are correlated with reductions in, in this over time. According to the Prescription Drug uh, Monitoring Center for Excellence at Brandeis. So, so I think that there are going to be some tweaks to these systems in the next year, two, or three that will begin to allow these things to talk between states uh, that will ease the, the uh, burden on physicians in terms of, in terms of 
not in terms of time invested, because guys, I'm not going to pretend that this is not going to be time. It's going to be time. And that's something that we all have very little of. Um, but, in, but in terms of ease of reporting of abuse of these things. So um, I'm optimistic. I'm a perpetually optimistic guy. In public health, we tend to be optimists. But um, uh, let, and, and in fact, I, I think your point is, is well made. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about CSMDs just here for a couple minutes. And, um, and, and if we have some other solutions, uh, let's, let's discuss those as well. One, one interesting thing about PDMPs, uh, they will help us evaluate uh, a number of different aspects of uh, what we're trying to do in terms of interventions as well. So this is ours in this state. Uh, this is the login for the CSMD. Um, this slide, well, okay, you guys, okay, has everybody, everybody seen this? Okay, of course. All right. <laughs> let, me, let me go to, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll do that in a minute. This slide is troubling. From the Controlled Substance Monitoring Database in 2008, their data set indicated that 272 million doses of hydrocodone were prescribed in Tennessee for 6.2 million Tennessee residents, which equates to 40, 44 uh, 43, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll downgrade it, 43 hydrocodone, hydrocodone doses per person, man, woman, and child in Tennessee in 2008. You might say, well, that's a fluke. That's an anomaly. This is the 2011 data. 275 million doses, all right? So between these two years, 272 and 275, these are fairly robust numbers, are they not? Now, the next one down is uh, aprazolam, right? So I'm sorry, these go in reverse order. This is hydrocodone, hydrocodone. Aprazolam, aprazolam, okay? Oxycodone, oxy, codeine, right, and so on. This is a massive amount of hydro, massive amount of hydrocodone in this area. Now, you all know, I show this slide to people who are outside this loop. They don't, they can't understand this, right? I mean, this is unbelievable. My buddy, right, that I grew up with, uh, had a 40 pill a day addiction for hydro, codone alone, not to mention his soma, which potentiated the effect of the hydro. So, so this, so we know that what's going on here is there's a massive amount of the abuse uh, that's driving this, okay? Question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we know this is what was the crime, but do we know how many of those prescriptions were filled? And the reason I asked, and this is purely uh -huh. anecdotal, just based on one, one thing that I know of, but my adult daughter recently had one 2,000. Mm -hmm. um, they said they were prescribed with a prescriber. I warned her because she has reactions to everything. I right. warned her, you know, you want to be careful about starting taking something mm -hmm. unless you need it. Right. So she said, oh, she said, it's just one tooth. They're not going to prescribe much of anything. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're going to be surprised. Let me guess, 12. 12 hydro. No, what, uh, oxycodone. Oxycodone, really? Oxycodone. How many? So, I don't know, several days worth. Yeah. You know, for one tooth. Yeah. And, um, you know, and she told them, you know, the nurse said, I'm going to give you a prescription. And I said, out of curiosity, what mm -hmm. are you prescribing her? Mm -hmm. And... She told me, and I, I said, what is that? Is it a narcotic? What is it? And she said, oh, it's oxycodone. And I said, oh, God. Mm -hmm. And I said, Rihanna? And she said, I'm not going to take that. Mm -hmm. she, said, I, she said, I cut a Tylenol in half. Mm -hmm. I have reactions to things. Sure. I, don't, I won't take it. And yeah. she said, well, let us just prescribe it for you just to be safe so you have it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm asking. Mm -hmm. I think Still, sometimes they, yeah. they, they have no they, way they to monitor no way. what I wrote. Okay. The only way yeah. they can monitor is what the pharmacy filters, yeah. the pharmacy reports. Okay, so this, okay, so this isn't prescribed, this is filled. Yeah. Okay. Now, 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 this is an interesting question, though. Um, and, I, and I would also say that the, um, that the folks who have a 40 pill a day addiction are driving this more than people who, who aren't filling their scripts anyway. So, so it's uh, because that, that physiologic addiction is really, I mean, that's a strong motivator. Now, at, this, at, the, um, 
At the same time, that does happen quite a bit that folks, you know, my dad, for example, he's not going to ever use. Uh, What's uh, happened that's repeatedly yeah. over the years. Okay. Yes, sir. There's been a real change in uh, expectation mm -hmm. from patients. I've been in Tennessee since 1993. Mm -hmm. In 1993, someone comes in, they sprain their ankle, they have mm -hmm. a toothache, whatever. Naperson is fine. Yeah, a couple, a couple of ibuprofen, right? You walk yeah. in the, they walk in the door now, they stub their, regardless of what it is, the first thing they ask for right. is hydrocodone. And this is everybody. It's not an isolated case. Yep. 20 years ago, it was very isolated. Now, everyone walks through the door. If they do not get a narcotic for almost anything, an earache, conjunctivitis, regardless, yes. they feel that they haven't been treated appropriately. Such a huge point. I mean, this, this is a... So there is a national level discussion in the peer-reviewed literature right now happening about the use of opioids for anything that's not cancer-related. I mean, what do you do? I mean, okay, you've got some orthopedic injuries, right, occasionally. But, but greatly restricting the amount of opioids that are prescribed uh, for things that are not cancer-related. So I've got, I got all kinds of cool handouts for you guys. And one of them is basically it's just a cover, the cover of a document. I'll show you the whole document. It's a cover document that you can print out. It's 55 pages long. Uh, that basically is uh, Washington State's prescribing guidelines where they talk about this issue specifically. Okay, I'll, I'll give you guys this handout in a little bit. You want to make a point? No, I'm sorry. You want to make a point in the back first? I just wanted to make a point about the database. Mm -hmm. uh, the one of the problems I have with it is it does not include methadone. Mm -hmm. I guess because the methadone is dispensed directly right. from the so, I mean, I didn't know that actually. And that is a real problem yeah. for us, is because Virginia. Oh, in, in yeah. Tennessee it does. Okay, all, all right, good. I'll, yeah, I'll practice in Virginia. So oh. it, is not this is a perfect illustration of the fact that these systems are, are, uh, are, are different between states, right? We've got to get to this place where we have some standardization between systems. It is the same problem, if I may build a bridge here with our earlier speaker, right? It's the same problem we have with the EHRs. Here on this campus, um, my understanding is that the physician practice um, uses one EHR, and the, the uh, nursing clinic uses another one, right? Psych is using, going to use another one. They don't talk to each other. They don't, the hospital uses another. So they, and they don't talk to each other. And, and our attempt, our, our public health attempt, if you will, at getting these things kind of connected and aligned called CareSparked, we never could find a footing for, for how to get this uh, to happen, a, a market-driven, because at some point, grants don't work anymore. <laughs> yeah, things have to be sustainable. But we tried to work this out with the CHR issue, which would have really helped us out uh, locally with this uh, prescription drug problem. But another comment, yes, sir. I had this, you know, talking about why there was a change in prescribing habits. Is I uh, actually I complained. <laughs> Joint Commission literally, if you wanted to be accredited, you had to post mm -hmm. that you would address your patient's pain. Mm -hmm. So when we went to the Joint Commission, they gave me a hassle. And I turned around and gave them the Southwest Virginia date on a death per week mm -hmm. of oxycodone overdose. Wow. They're kind of like, okay, we won't write you up this time, mm -hmm. but you still have to post it. Wow. So I had to post that stupid thing so the patients can see it. Mm -hmm. So what I did at the same time is I called the sheriff and said, would you give me a letter saying mm -hmm. you'll prosecute anybody <laughs> yeah. who will divert it or what or misuse it. Right. And I, had a, I got a his letter and I posted it inside the exam room. On Very the, good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's good. Nobody's, nobody's getting, a, getting a single milligram of... Uh, but that's of, uh, not really driven by the Joint Commission. That was driven by the pharmaceutical in industry yes. financing the... Well, the six vital signs. No, they, they there you go. That very there you <laughs> go. That it was important enough for you to address everybody's pain. So now that was the clinical decision. They had a meeting in Germany. This conversation is huge. What you just said, pain as a six vital sign. Would you, would you elaborate on that for a second? Because that is part of what's driving this, this whole issue. Well, that didn't exist when I started out. Right. But started in the 90s, didn't it? It started in the 90s, and, and I think if you research it, I haven't done that, but mm -hmm. I'm told by others that if you research it, it was a um, pharmaceutical company yeah. funded PR campaign right. that was very effective. That's right. And, and <clears throat> to the point that Joint Commission adopted it in their performance. So you, do, you remember, do you remember when I mentioned this, uh, this, this idea of, of uh, economics driving this thing? Yeah, there's a lot of money being made here. 
There's a well, lot of money being made here. The other side to that is it's not a vital sign at any rate because a sign is something you can measure. When they come into the office, I don't ask them how much they weigh. I weigh them. I don't ask them what they think their blood pressure is. I take it. Mm -hmm. when they, but then I sit there and say, what do you think your pain is? Mm -hmm. And I go in the hospital room and see an older fellow mm -hmm. who's sitting there cringing, saying it's two, yeah. and a young guy who's cutting up saying it's 15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on a scale of 10. Absolutely yeah. ridiculous number. It's worthless. I don't even bother asking the question because that particular number is totally worthless. Everybody knows when they come in the office, they say it's a 10. Uh, so it has to be a vital symptom. You can't even call it a vital sign because it's not quantifiable. It's a strong point. Yeah. So in terms of the economics, you said that uh, mm -hmm. for Florida, yeah. there was an investigative report a, a few months ago mm -hmm. about <clears throat> three pharmacies in Florida that were outliers in terms of oxycodone mm -hmm. uses. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make up some numbers, but they're not much more outrageous exactly. than what was in the actual report. Mm -hmm. But the average Florida ph pharmacy distributed something like 6,000 units per month of, of oxycodone. These three pharmacies were way off the scale. Mm -hmm. One of them that I do remember, 150,000 doses per month. One pharmacy. Broward County. And so obviously the, uh, the distributors for, for the pharmaceuticals know which pharmacies do this and it's obviously not uh, it, it, there are a lot of pharmacies in florida so it, it it's not that that somebody's just that somebody's prescribing a lot but that some pharmacies are it would seem filling an unreasonable yeah. amount yeah yeah it's all part of a closed loop isn't it i mean we we know where these pills are made we can track them all the way down to when they're distributed and we know in whose house bad grammar in whose house they reside, right? We, I mean, we, this is not the same for heroin. This is a fascinating thing, and one of the things that is driving this is economics. And, 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 and are pharmacies possibly complicit in all this? Some of them may be, right? So, so is there data like that for Tennessee? Do you know? I would have seen it. They're, cutting, they're, cut, they're restricting the number of doses that go to each pharmacy. Are they? Right now, that started happening within the last six months. Okay. So some of the pharmacies are saying, eh, we're not going to fill someone who has a prescription from out of county. Even. Mm -hmm. It started out of state about a year ago. Now they're saying they won't fill a prescription out of county mm -hmm. from a prescriber out of county because they're all being restricted. Uh, the the uh, uh, distributors are restricting how many doses are allowed per month to each pharmacy. It's no longer a supply and demand. This is... We are restricting how many you can get. Yeah, and this, this is. They could do that in Florida. Yeah. Um, what's making them do it in Tennessee? Well, they, the DEA has closed pharmacies that dispense large numbers. Go to the DEA website and you can they, read. They, they prosecute pharmacies just like they do physicians. Apparently, they, could, apparently yeah. they couldn't in Florida for whatever yeah. reason. I, I, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I will. Uh, I'll look into it for this for this slide deck for the future because I, I think uh, for other clinic, if it's, especially when I'm giving this to pharmacists and clinicians, because that's an interesting topic. Um, this is a promising uh, finding right here that that they're beginning to restrict uh, folks from uh, going to pharmacies out of county. That, you know, I don't know about trade regulations and things. I mean, I, I don't know how that all plays out, but but it's it'll be interesting to to see. That was in Tennessee. That example was. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it, it's a. It's at the discretion of the pharmacist, just like writing it is for us. That's true. Well, but if, they, if they've got a limited, the supply that they are receiving has become limited. Right. So they're told pharmacy X, you are getting so many units of, of oxycodone or hydrocodone per month, and so you can dispense them however you want. Right. You're only going to get. 10,000 units or 5,000 units or whatever it is, and so that the, the pharmacies themselves have been the ones that have said, well, if we only get 5,000, we certainly cannot fill for these people coming from out of from Kentucky or coming from mm -hmm. uh, three counties away. Right, right. So um, in the interest of time, I just noticed <laughs> uh, the time. I, I've... Uh, uh, encourage discussion throughout this, and I love it, all right, and it's enriching the conversation. We do have to get to our group activities, too, in which, at which point we'll, we'll really engage in a deeper discussion, I hope, about this. Uh, so let me get through the rest of these slides real quick, and, and um, 
because I want to there at the end of this there's there are a couple things I want to show you guys that I think will be useful to you um, uh, in your practice so uh, of course I already showed you this 272 and 275 pretty similar I, I was starting to point to this earlier but the Virginia prescription monitoring program and the Tennessee are very different um, they, they don't even look their interface isn't the same and they don't talk to each other or, at least right now the Prescription Safety Act <coughs> of 2012 was signed by uh, Governor Haslam on the steps of the Anderson County Courthouse. Anderson County is where I'm from, right? Um, Anderson County actually had the distinction of being um, the highest meth abusing county at one point in the state. I think we beat him now. Putnam. Yeah, is it Putnam County? <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. I think Unicoi County uh, is, is, uh, is angling for that uh, distinction as well. But um, anyway, uh, he, he signed it there. It requires all prescribers from Bristol to Memphis, physicians, dentists, and others to check the state's controlled substance monitoring database for patient's drug history before prescribing any painkiller or tranquilizer. This is a good thing to me, okay? I know that a whole lot of clinicians were upset about this, uh, um, that, there was, that there's a lot of pushback on this. And folks, I recognize time. I mean, I do. This is, this is a major issue. Now, what they, now there, there are some um, workarounds here. You, you, know, you can assign different folks to, to put this stuff in. It doesn't have to be the, uh, the uh, uh, well, it, it's not a one-to-one -one between who prescribes and puts it in at this point, is my understanding. So um, this, is, uh, this is a 2011 slide on the, on the PDMPs. Um, so I believe that by 2012, I believe Florida got theirs up and running. Um, and some have dropped out for funding, but they're trying to get them back. And, uh, but we've had ours for, what, it's 07, right? Seven, eight, seven years, six years. Uh, PDMP data is critical in evaluating interventions. Uh, so as we do things, to like, like uh, this restriction on, on sending um, oxycodone or hydrocodone to counties, right? We may be able to, to look at the effect of that intervention through PDMP data later on. Like, uh, what is the prescribing rate in that community? I mean, is that, uh, there's some supply and demand sides to that in the, that we may be able to examine. There are a number of different things that, that we can, uh, we, a number of different ways that we can look at PDMP data. It's fascinating though, as a public health researcher, uh, it's very difficult for me to access this data. <coughs> we're, we're getting, in, we're engaging in conversations with the state PDMP to, uh, to, to be able to do so. Uh, they have their own epidemiologists at this point, so we're hoping to work in collaboration with them. Uh, they're expanding out that, that operation in the state, and I'm very hopeful for, for how we're going to operate with them in the future with our team here. So anyway, there's all, all, all different kinds of uh, ways that we can evaluate our interventions through that. Um, okay, so this, this is what I am hoping will be useful for, for you. So what are MEDs? Has anybody ever used the concept of MEDs? Morphine equivalent dosages? Any, raise your hands here. Okay. MEDs are morphine equivalent dosages. It's a method of standardizing the volume of consumed opioids in a day, okay? There's strong evidence, epidemiologic evidence, for a significant increase in opioid-related morbidity and mortality above 100 MED, morphine equivalents per day, okay? We'll show you some of that. Here's, here's wow, man. It, all right, so anyway, uh, this, this study was 45 overdoses, looking at a hazard ratio for different dosage levels of MED, standardizing the MED. We got a little MED exercise for one of the groups a little bit later on. All right, try to, try to calculate the MEDs for, for uh, different, different uh, uh, abusers. So this says uh, less than 20 milligrams per day morphine equivalents, right? Could be X number of hydrocodone, X number of oxycodone, et cetera, right? The hazard ratio for those guys is one, right? 20 to 50, 44% uh, increase, it's right there, that's that number right there. 20 to 50 milligrams per day, MED, 44% increase in risk. 50 to 100 milligrams per day, four times increase in risk for overdose or overdose death, okay? And greater than 100 morphine equivalents Almost a nine times increase in risk. Is your number correct? Or 
the lower doses there's more risk than for the higher doses? No, this, these, uh, this is a, a goof up in this table, I, I believe, that these are people who uh, basically had no opioid dose, right? So basically, this is, a, this, is the, this is the referent group, one. This group did not have any op uh, opioids, right? So, so zero opioids. So they actually, their risk for, for overdose was, right, uh, three times less. That's the way, that, that's the way odds ratios or, or hazard ratios are, are seen below one. And then the increase beyond two is two times, but less than one or less than two in between one and two is a percentile so or a percentage so 44 percent increase in risk three times 373 percent increase in risk then a 900 percent increase in risk basically or nine times that's how you review that that's, that's how you view the hazard ratios so um, th this is one of about six published studies that point to the same phenomenon of skyrocketing hazard, right, with, uh, with MEDs. So Washington State got a hold of this type of, uh, type of data, and they basically said, okay, we're going to institute a guide for prescribing, and uh, we're going to do this in 2000, I think they did it in 2007 or 8, right? So once they instituted it, really it keyed on this yellow flag um, between providers, this yellow flag system of, of MEDs at 120. All right, so once they, once they factor in this 120, and I've got a handout that's it's, it's got the exact website for this opioid prescribing guideline from this group that I'm going to give to everybody here, okay? Now, um, they saw a 27% reduction in MED, MED per day, morphine equivalent dosages per day, with the opioid pain reliever OPR guide, okay? And a 50% reduction in overdose death rate in, in uh, 2010 from the 2009 rate. Now, I emailed the author, and I said, I'm really curious, because one of the limitations of the study, you've got to know, if you know anything about stats, you know about regression to the mean, right? So one of the, one of the limitations of the study is, uh, what happened in 2011? Right? I'm really curious about 2011, and I haven't heard back from him yet. But, uh, but this, this is promising, folks. This is very, very interesting. And uh, we're um, so promising. I mean, this, these are, this, this is uh, workers' comp data, okay? But this right here, this, I'm sorry, my thing is not, no, I'm pointing right there, all right? This trend downwards right here is a big deal because remember we're we're looking at in the rest of the nation increasing rate of prescription opioids right just like this. Well, look, yearly yearly trend of scheduled opioids. Well, these are the threes and they're going down. The twos were were increasing as these were beginning to go down, and now the twos are going down. That's that's a big deal. So the CDC. You know they're they're not going to do anything unless unless it's pretty pretty good. They they made some recommendations, um, basically saying if a patient's dosage has increased to 120 morphine milligram equivalents per day, without substantial improvement in pain and function, seek a consult from a pain specialist. So this is this is well back from from uh, you know limiting 120 MEDs, but. Um, uh, but basically still making those recommendations. And they also, they also put in this caveat right here. The following recommendations are not founded in evidence-based research, but are based on promising interventions and expert opinion. Okay? So that's where we are right now. This is still on the CDC's website. Yes, sir? Well, you have to assume that the pain specialists are actually looking and trying to help the problem. Every time I've had a patient go to a pain management clinic, mm -hmm. they end up on five times the dose that I had them on before they left. Hence, you can't assume that. Right, so I, I, I agree that, that in an ideal world, that is exactly what you should assume. I, I, and I understand exactly where you're, where you're coming from on that. But uh, there, this type of thinking, I think, needs to become more pervasive in, in, uh, in our regular clinics, right? Our family practice clinics and, and, uh, and primary care clinics. Uh, but uh, we've got to educate folks about this. And, and, and alternates to opioid therapy for non-cancer pain if possible, right? We've got to be reasonable about this.
Sir. You know, it's interesting. It's not the first time I've seen that 120 number up. And it's been a couple of years since I've looked at this. Mm -hmm. But the, I think the interesting thing is it seems like they're basing this on risk of the opioids past 120 right. milligrams. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, the data, there's actually very little data to show how effective any of this is. And like, <laughs> the consensus program on there, that's basically, when we looked at this, the only thing we could find mm -hmm. was that there was a consensus among pain specialists that anything over 120 milligrams was, was people didn't have benefit and actually ended up having problems. But yeah. they, you know, we're using this medicine without any kind of study how beneficial it really is. That's a good point. That's a good point. I think I think that literature is beginning to emerge. What about yes, the VA? Their prescribing isn't on the, the website that we go to, mm -hmm. the CSMB. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, at our practice, we have veterans who come there, and there's a VA right here in town. Right. You know, they're typically prescribed lots of opiates. Yeah. I, I can't. I can't. I can't speak to it. Unless there's a federal, you know, monitoring. Um, you know, like not just state to state to state, but yeah. include the VA as well. Yeah. They shouldn't be immune to reporting. And it's a good point. I, I can't speak to it. I'm not, I, I just don't know they, the, the rules. Themselves. The VA here in Johnson City, I had some patients that were actually coming up here, uh -huh. and they have stopped prescribing op opioids at the VA in Knoxville and the VA in Johnson City. Really? So any yeah, patients yeah. now that are requiring chronic opioid management are being mm -hmm. told they have to go to Murfreesboro. Really? Wow. Okay. Very good point. Uh, I, I think I'm getting the hook. No, no, right. no. Is this uh, vaud vaudeville, right? The you yanking of me off? No, what I would do is just keep going. Okay. Get a quarter to. Oh, well, great. You got their attention. Uh, yeah, I hope so. All right. Very cool. I, I got the opposite of a hook. He pushed me back on stage. <laughs> I, you know, I can't sing. I can't dance. I wave my hands around and, and jump up and down a little bit. Um, I got a, just a few more slides. Um, this is this, this is an interesting question. I, I was desperately looking for crime stats, and I've been looking for crime, good crime stats for a while. Can't come up with good crime stats. It's driving me nuts. And maybe I should know where to look, but but I did come up with this slide. I thought, well, we'll, we'll draw draw this up real quick. Economic costs of PDAM, prescription drug abuse and misuse, about fifty three billion they estimate. Okay, now these are Economic estimations, right? They're they're um, uh, they probably got some confidence intervals around them like this, pretty wide, but um, seventy nine percent attributable to lost productivity, right? Now this is abuse and misuse, not just use, not just orthopedic injury. All right, that's not what we're talking about. This is abuse and misuse. So seventy nine percent of this just lost productivity makes sense, right? They're um, opiates. 15% uh, to criminal justice costs, 4% to drug abuse treatment, 2% to medical complications. And then, of course, five drugs accounted for two-thirds of the loss. I thought it was an interesting stat. A couple of other additional things I want to leave you with here. Uh, what's in your medicine cabinet? This is a drug take-back event. Uh, our pharmacy school, Gatton College of Pharmacy, does a great job with these. Um, a couple of my colleagues work, I work closely with, uh, Dr. Jeff Gray, uh, Spearheads, this uh, take back alongside his colleague uh, Nick Hagemeyer, we've proposed a study to the National Institute of Drug Abuse to do a really good accounting of how many pounds of this stuff is controlled and, and sort of what it is, like a good inventory of these. Uh, and they've been doing some, uh, some work in this arena already and have published some of it. <clears throat> so that, th this is drug take backs are actually a way to um, see how much is in the wild, if you will. How much is in the marketplace? How much can we move out of that uh, marketplace? And, um, and it's just one event, or one, one way to do that. And we're trying to increase the number of these. Um, this one was big and splashy. It was in the paper. Man, I'm trying to remember how many tons of medicine they've collected this way. It's a lot. It's a lot. But... A ton of controls, yeah. And, and they're, at this point, uh, the DEA is actually seeking to uh, not allow any access to these to people who want to count them. I don't know why. Uh, but it's actually in direct opposition to, uh, to what we're trying to do, which is to substantiate the, uh, the, the amount of this that's, that's being, and see if we can't see if there's an increase or decrease based on you know, community education type efforts. But um, that, that uh, Jeff was telling me just recently, this, this week in fact, 
Jeff Gray, who is, is closely affiliated with this effort, he was telling me that uh, people bring in all kinds of stuff, Centrum and you know, a lot of antibiotics, et cetera. So um, they're, they, um, they're doing their best on this. Uh, there's the Tennessee Drug Diversion Task Force. This, this is actually, these, these folks are pretty connected. There's folks in the state police that operate with the Drug Diversion Task Force. There are physicians, pharmacists, et cetera. They're, they're actively working to, um, to decrease the amount of diversion in the state. Um, they haven't updated their slide rec- or their, uh, their website that recently, but, but uh, they're, they're active. Uh, Dr. Steve Lloyd, some of you guys may know him, is um, affiliated with this group. So that's a statewide effort. Uh, and there are community-based actions going on that are more education and orientation, right? So um, there are all these coalitions, uh, civic groups. I, I think that churches, especially in our region, uh, you know, it's a very strong um, uh, part of our, our fabric in, this, in this, um, this region. I think that these the churches are wildly underutilized as health education uh, venues in, substance, in the substance use arena. There are, there are some... Uh, church-based obesity diet and, and other types of interventions that have been proven to be effective, but less on the uh, substance abuse side of things. I think that that's a real good potential avenue. Of course, local education and the 10 care fraud investigation uh, team is, is active in this. <laughs> Two more things. Okay, three more things. Um, we, we recently uh, had this paper accepted, um, Physician and Pharmacist Perceptions about Interprofessional Communication for Prescription Drug Abuse and Misuse. Now, we had an event here last year. John Dreisner came. There's a fellow from Samsha that came. Was anybody at that event where we talked about prescription drug abuse? It was in March of last year and about, hold on a second, 63 prescribers and 25 pharmacists were there, and it was all about PDAM. It was a Saturday event. Is anybody there? You were there? Okay. Uh, well, we, if you remember, we did a survey with you guys. First, we did an informed consent. Then we did a survey, all right? And, uh, and, and these, these are the results of the survey. All right, and this is recently uh, accepted, as I mentioned. So let's look at this in a little bit of detail. Among prescribers, we wanted to know your perception... Now, this, is, this isn't quantified, right? This is your perception. We're asking you, just like at a conference like this, a little, little different, but some, somewhat. And this is a pretest. This is bef- in the morning before they saw a whole bunch of uh, talks about this. It includes some very powerful ones. Um, how many of your patients are abusing opioids? Well, let's call them OPRs, opioid pain relievers. All right. The percentage of prescribers who think that their patients are abusing is around 20, right, a little less. But pharmacists say, oh my gosh, uh, you know, y'all wouldn't believe it, it's 40% plus. What about a percentage of patients with legitimate medical reasons? Well, the, the prescribers said, you know, clearly, since I'm prescribing, uh, you know, this uh, at least 85%. And... Um, and uh, the pharmacist said, well, maybe not so much. Now, the ends are small, but, but still, it's interesting. Percentage of Tri-Cities other than you, <laughs> right, who over-prescribe OPRs, right? Well, this is, uh, this is 40%. All my co- well, 40% of my colleagues over-prescribe. And pharmacists is kind of interesting. So it's not me. Right, um, and and percentage of Tri Cities pharmacists that dispense in an abuse enabling manner. Okay, and and uh, then this is the opposite, right, of the of the question up here, when 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 uh, pharmacists got to rate their uh, the the patients when they were coming in. Okay, percentage of Tri Cities pharmacies who dispense in an abuse enabling manner, and physicians, and I'm sorry, prescribers uh, tended to believe that that was a higher number than the pharmacists. That's one set of slides. So then we asked, we said, would improved communication help combat prescription drug abuse and misuse? We believe, we believe that communication between providers, prescribers, and dispensers, and patients, we believe that improved communication 
through skill development, and we got some ide specific ideas about this in a group activity here in a little bit, we believe that there's a strong likelihood that we can impact how much of this is going on, okay? Improved communication. What if, what if, what if you were able to communicate to one of your peers this concept about MEDs in less than 120, and you guys had that as your ethic, and, and, then, you're, and then all of a sudden, you know, you've got a, a known uh, a drug abuser coming in, and your buddies your, that's in your practice with you is prescribing to them. You know, we've got a little uh, vignette. Or, I, I'm going to challenge you guys to come up with a, a, a conversation about that in a little bit. Okay, so, um, so here what we find. Improved communication, would it help? Prescribers, 84% of prescribers said, yeah. And 92% of pharmacists said, yes. How about interpersonal uh, communication between the patient and the, and the pharmacist? Well, there's a different, slight difference there. But almost everybody thought that improved communication would be good. And I think the distinctions between aren't, aren't, aren't large enough to really uh, to note. Here's an interesting question. Only 44% um, of prescribers had in treatment facility information in their practice setting. So, 40, so there's a great uh, potential for improvement there. And then this last slide on this topic, uh, my perception of, is, of uh, prescription drug abuse and misuse is a problem in my practice, either prescribing or dispensing setting. Okay, and then what does it say? Strongly agree and agree, all right? Are the green and blue. So I believe it's a problem in my setting. So it's a, it's a problem for 60% of the folks, they say, right? Neutral disagree or strongly disagree, these down here, only 40%. I'm confident in my ability, I like this one, I'm confident in my ability to detect patient drug abuse issues in my practice setting. All right, so strongly agree and agree is about 70%, 68%, I think that's right, 68%. Now remember, well, let's not go back in the interest of time. I'm confident in my ability to discuss potential drug abuse issues with my patients, roughly the same. Strongly or, or uh, agree. And I'm confident in my ability to discuss treatment facility options with potential addicts. And yet, only 44% had, uh, had that information at their, at their uh, facility. So, so we believe that there is an avenue for, for prevention, all right, and an avenue for intervention through um, increased communication. And so uh, last year, a... Um, a proposal, I'm sorry, a request for proposals was put, put out by NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And they said, uh, we want to help universities develop their research infrastructure and in substance abuse. So can, you know, potential universities, can you uh, put forward some ideas? And so we got a team together, and, and one of them, Nick Hagemeyer, had, had, had uh, heard Fred talk about APNET and the PBRN concept, right? And, and Nick had been talking to uh, Fred, and, and, uh, and Nick came to this idea, and he came to this meeting. He said, you know what, I've been working on health communication. I've been working on, um, uh, you know, this concept of getting pharmacies networked in communities. You know, is there a way that we could imagine how to connect up with pharmacies and clinics uh, and do some sort of intervention program? What could we base it on? Well, we've had this idea about communication for a while. We, uh, we know this other communication stuff about, about uh, MEDs, right? And, and we have some intervention concepts. Well, what if we put together a, um, a proposal? So we did. And uh, so the proposal has within it, uh, it's a NIDA proposal, three science-based projects about physician and pharmacist communication, a project about physician and patient communication, and then a detailed study of drug take-back program results. And then, and then sandwiched, I guess, the bread on, this, on the meat of these three proposals, the bread on the outside, is sort of a training program for our, uh, for our graduate and professional students and, and faculty to get better engaged in substance abuse research. We don't have the funding yet. We just proposed it. It went in last, uh, last month, actually. Well, I, uh, it went in January. So uh, uh, anyway, it's under review. We'll see what happens. Uh, I, I can't speak to our chances. Yeah. <laughs> Not, NIDA is one of the NIH, uh, one of the National Institutes of Health. At this point, they're funding 6%. So, um, last slide. Actually, it's the second to last slide. Uh, all right, 
my four, these, these are my four biggest slides, okay? 43 hydrocodone pills were prescribed per Tennessean. Since there's so many of these things out there in cabinets, plenty of people have them, right? 75% have them available for initiation of pill abuse, all right? There's a direct correlation between the number of these things in the wild and overdose and death. And the curve can be bent. The most troubling thing about this presentation should be everything's going straight up. The most promising thing about this presentation is there's a way, I, I think there's a way to bend the curve. In fact, the article that published the, 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 this American Journal of Industrial, it's not any industrial medicine, right? Workers' comp data, they bent this curve. It's called bending the curve. I brought it if you guys want a copy of it, okay? That is promising to me. I have been doing this a long time, right? I've been thinking about this a lot, and uh, it's complicated. This is not just, uh, it's not just triadic. I mean, this has many, it has so many dimensions. Or again, we know where the pills are made. We see them being, they're, they're inspected by our government. We know the whole system, all the way down to the consumer, and they're supposed to put it in their mouth. We know we got, we got contact with that all the way to there. And yet we have this massive increase in overdose deaths. We can bend the curve. All right? And we got to do it. So uh, that's my last slide. I've got to tell you uh, one last thing. So the, the story and the data and, and the, you know, that whole thing. Uh, so my buddy um, grew up with him uh, in East Tennessee, and um, he had a massive pain pill addiction. He, um, he had a um, 40 to 50 lore set, no, yeah, lore set, a day addiction. Massive, plus soma. And his day job was prescription drug seeker. So remember the continuum? He's well down the continuum of risk for overdose and death. He OD'd twice. And his wife at the time said, look, if you don't go to treatment, uh, I'm going to divorce you. And by her rights, right? I mean, seriously, this is, this is really dangerous. He, he, you know, he had little kids and so on. And um, anyway, so um, to make a long story short, OD'd, OD'd, treatment came out, was doing really good, pretty good was open about his addiction because, man, he had hit it well for a long time, a long time. And um, one day was cleaning out his now ex-wife's <laughs> gutters on his old house. He was living in a new place. Fell off the roof and shattered his leg. Right? Walked with a cane at 36 years old. Shattered his leg. So what do you do? You got a, you got a 40 or 50 a day hydro habit. You got a real orthopedic injury. Um, fast forward six months, eight months, nine months, um, couldn't handle it anymore. And he took his life. So he's one of those. But um, anyway, we can bend the curve. We have the ability, we have the obligation. Okay? So there you have it. I can be contacted here. I've got uh, my cards are out here somewhere. Um, I've got four activities, and uh, do we need to take a break, Fred? Is that is that probably in the cards, or is it? Uh, was ten thirty? Five minutes for questions. Oh, the next speaker. Seriously. Oh man, I got I got four activities I can give you guys. I'll tell you what. There there's some there are certain things I want to give you though. Okay, so I've got ten copies of our um, of our activities for four different groups. I didn't know how many people were going to be here. I'll tell you what's in there. Um, one of them is an MED exercise with three guides for ME, how to calculate MED. All right? If you're interested in that, take one of those packets. Work through the exercise yourself. The second activity was going to be you guys developing a skit 
or a stand-up comedy act or a something. I didn't know how much time I had. I honestly didn't. Hey, I'll tell you something funny. So Fred called me the other day, and he said, uh, we got a little more time than we thought because we had an adjustment in the, in the uh, speaker lineup, and uh, so I just made up some stuff. But the second one was you guys developing a skit or a role play or a stand-up comedy act for two different things. One of them was, um, one of them was uh, communication, right, the, the, tri- the triadic thing. And the other one was how do you coach a parent? How do you coach a parent how to lock up their pills in their house? The third one um, was, uh, I forgot, uh, the fourth one, uh, the fourth one I'll tell you, the fourth one was a New England Journal article um, that is basically, Anna Lemke from Stanford is basically saying, why do physicians continue to prescribe opioids to known opioid abusers? The answer is, uh, well, you'll, you can see. Okay, you can see it's a two-page letter in New England Journal, right? And it's basically saying, she's saying, because there's a market for it. It's a, it's a supply demand. They continue to do it because there's a market for it, okay? And the third one, I've forgotten. It's there right here. But I'm going to set all these out here. Um, now, oh, and the most important thing I have for you guys, I want everybody to have one of these. So this is uh, group one, the MED exercise. Group two is communication, Okay. And there's only 10 of each, so uh, you have to decide which ones you want the most. This one is spotting abuse. So the third one is spotting abuse. So what I gave you is I gave you six quantitative instruments that you may use to help you spot abusers in your clinic. Okay, now the first one's called the opiate abuse spotting tool or something like that. Uh, the second one, I mean, some of them are just like the CESD, right? The Center for something for uh, depression. Uh, opioid risk tool, the CAGE aid questionnaire, et cetera, et cetera. So there's six of these. These are also in this packet, uh, which can be downloaded from the Internet. It's 55 pages long. Okay, this is, the, this, this is a link to the opioid prescriber guideline, guidelines. This right here tells you exactly where to go get it. All right? And uh, the last one was... Um, the New England Journal letter. There's 10 copies of that in here. That is my um, whole talk. I would love to chat with you guys. I'm going to ask, I'm going to answer any questions. Yeah, yes, sir. And this speaks to your friend's issue. Is there, do you have any data on where addictions start? Because that's the other conflicting thing that we get from our patients. You know, they'll say, it's yeah. not started me on this medicine. All right. I've been addicted since. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, unfortunately. I'm going I'm to speak to this, though, from a, from a public health perspective. Um, folks who have a harder, faster drug sequence after initiation, which usually happens with either inhalants or marijuana or early alcohol abuse, folks with a harder, faster drug sequence tend to be higher thrill seekers, tend to abuse opiates more. Okay, this is empirically validated. Uh, however, the drug sequencing and gateway uh, hypothesis, uh, those, that, that literature is full of competition, that's not the right word, uh, competing uh, perspectives on this. Is marijuana a gateway drug? Well, okay, I don't know. But uh, Vicodin sure could be, couldn't it? Uh, so, there, so there's, I mean, and, and, and there's, um, we, we, we've got an analysis going on right now about this exact topic. Um, I can't speak to it, in, I can't give you the whole landscape on this. I, I will say that um, if there are drugs in the wild and people initiate and they have a genetic predisposition toward addiction, and they um, like the opiates, right? And they're in a situation where they can use them without a lot of oversight. Uh, I think the tendency for, for transitioning into, from, from abuse to uh, uh, dependence is high. Now, my buddy, uh, Stephen Lloyd, who does this talk, uh, does a similar talk to this uh, a lot, and he's a physician, he couldn't be here. He, um, Stephen has a biopsychosocial uh, model, and he does a slide basically saying you've got to have access 
you got to have the gene genetic predisposition and you've got to use. And if you've got all three of those things together, then holy cow, you know, it's, it's a match to gasoline. Um, but if you take any one of them out, you're not going to have as, as much of a problem. Yes, sir. When we're seeing patients with, you know, five, ten, seven minutes, whatever, it's a very mm -hmm. short period of time, obviously we have to make decisions in a very quick time frame as to mm -hmm. what, is, is, there, is there a red flag there? If you were to give us three red flags that were the biggest ones, what are the three red flags of potential drug use? I'm going to let my colleagues from that have designed this interagency guideline on opioid dosing for chronic and uh, non-cancer pain. Okay, I'm going to let them speak to that because it's right here. Um, yeah, yeah, sexual abuse is a big one. That's right. So screening tools. Hold on one second. So the three big things. Before you decide to prescribe, I will, I will tell you that it's in here, okay? I'm, I'm going to have trouble getting to it right now. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm afraid that, that answer is going to have to suffice for our time. But, but they're, they're right. Starting or refilling? Because you're, you had the one slide up there that said about refilling if they have an early refill, if they're escalating. Those are there. I'm, I'm kind of looking at it as a new patient. I'm there. I'm there. Those are, those are aberrant, what they call aberrant behaviors, all the yeah. stuff. And there's a spectrum on that, but that doesn't titrate correlate quite as well as abuse. But, you know, as far as the risk gratification tool, those are certainly the other big ones. Well, there's some of the things that I see people say, well, you know, I got this one from the mom, it really helped. Uh, I had to bite them off the teeth because I was really hurting. Right. Uh, or, um, and it's funny, you know, when other they, people are really making it up, but I'm not. I, I really am. I need it worse yeah. than all these other people that are yeah. getting it. Those kind of things are red flags in my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. they're fair behaviors, and they're on a spectrum. You know, when we looked at it, there's, this, there's like about four lists of those kind of activities. I was surprised what the specialists put in the, in the less um, serious columns. Like some of the stuff we have there, for instance, the more serious columns. I mean, obviously, the, you know, some of the fortunes are great. Right. So uh, th this th this is very it's a very good perspective. I think it's dead on with what is it, what is proven in here. I couldn't find it quickly, but I will tell you what's on this opioid risk tool. Okay, the first one is family history of substance abuse, and and for certain ones you get certain points. All right, personal history of substance abuse, alcohol, illegal drugs, and prescription drugs, age. History of pre-adolescent sexual abuse, again, correlated with substance abuse for all kinds of self-medication reasons, masking, depression, all kinds of things. Uh, psychological disease, okay? ADD is on here. You get a point for that. Actually, you get two points for that. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar, and schizophrenia. You get, a point, you get two points for each of those. Uh, depression is on here. And then you roll all those up. Low risk is scores from zero to three moderate four to seven and so on. So that's, this is an empirical tool. Now, it's face valid, right? So you're asking somebody, you know, uh, sir, have you ever, were you sexually abused as a child? Right, I mean, you know, they, they, may, not, they may not respond to that if you, right, if you don't have a, a certain type of person who's gonna do it. So it's, it's, it's what we call in, in uh, survey methods, uh, face valid, all right? So there's no, I don't know if, there, uh, if there's no way to do it. These other tools are, are sort of tangentially associated with this, okay? Um, but I, I encourage you, I, I strongly encourage you, all of you, to go to uh, this website, download this document, and read through it. This opioid prescribing guidelines, less than 120, y'all. Seriously, I think, this, I think this can help us bend the curve. I'm going to try to communicate the same type of message to our, to our um, leaders in um, Nashville to see if we can't get some really good training on this concept um, out to all clinicians.